it's now time for Member Stevens, the member from Halliburton Court to next part. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As you know, this year we are proud to be celebrating the 100th anniversary of women having gained the right to vote in Ontario. This is a momentous milestone in the history of democracy in our province. The voices and votes of women have helped build this province, and I'm pleased to continue celebrating this important milestone. Many may not know that the Progressive Conservative Caucus has a long history of milestones when it comes to advancing women's rights in Ontario. It was Premier William Hearst's Progressive Conservative government that granted women the right to vote in 1917. The province's first woman cabinet minister, Margaret Birch, and the first woman federal cabinet minister, Ellen Fairclough, from Hamilton, were progressive conservatives. My colleagues and I are proud to continue this vital legacy, and we commit ourselves to helping Ontario women succeed. This evening, as part of the 100th anniversary celebrations, I am honoured to be hosting a reception to recognize our province's amazing women, past and present, representing a wide variety of backgrounds. I encourage all of us here in the Legislature to take the opportunity of this milestone to celebrate the achievements of Ontario women and to work together to foster even greater success in the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. For the member statements, the member from Timmins, James Bay. Well, Mr. Speaker, we have the honour today of having uh, many guests come in from Northern Ontario, mayors, chiefs, union leaders, and others, in order to talk about the good job that Northern Ontario has done and our forest industry has done when it comes to managing our forest. We all have heard of the legislation of the Endangered Species Act. Well, Northern Ontario was there way before there was ever an act under the Crown Forest Sustainability Act that was put in place in 1992-93. Forest companies are, by way of forest management plans, having to manage species at risk and other factors when it comes to figuring out how you're going to approach the, uh, the allowable cut and the sustainable cut in the forest. We are world leaders, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to how we manage our forests and how we approach the sustainability of those forests and how we balance off the interests of all of the various stakeholders. That's why. Uh, we have supported, and others have supported, and I believe the government supports as well, the idea that under the Endangered Species Act, that in fact the Crown Forest Sustainability Act be the vehicle by which we manage those particular issues. I am proud to be a Northerner. I am proud to be a member of the government that passed Crown Forest Sustainability Act and put in place the, the gold standard when it comes to forest management in this province. Uh, we were environmentalists before people started talking about it, and I think we all understood in the legislature legislature, all of us who worked on that, that this would be groundbreaking and it would bring us well into the next century so that we can do the right things when it comes to all the stakeholders in the forest, the animals, the people, the ecosystem, and to do what's right for our province. Thank you. Further member statements, member from Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This year, my riding of Kingston and the Islands celebrated its 14th annual nighttime Santa Claus parade, and it was absolutely the best one yet. The floats were outstanding and showcased some of Kingston's amazing community partners, nonprofits, multicultural groups, local radio and TV stations, and businesses. And as the streets filled with some of our favorite holiday songs, and I won't sing for you, don't worry, and cheer, sorry, it was also a great time to visit local business vendors and indulge in a delicious hot cup of chocolate. This year, my office partnered with the City of Kingston, Easter Seals Ontario, Southeastern Ontario and Rotary, Rotary Clubs of Kingston to create three dedicated accessible spaces or comfort zones for families and those with disabilities as well as ASL signers. This initiative was taken on by Kelly Wiley in my office and I want to thank you, Kelly, for all of your work. You were absolutely awesome. It ensured that the parade was safe, accessible and enjoyable for all. I'm so proud to report as well that we raised $3,000 for Kingston Food Bank and almost 3,000 pounds of non-perishable food items. I would also like to thank the City of Kingston sponsors, organizers for their exceptional parade this year. Thank you as well to the Frontenac paramedics. I was especially proud of the four-year-old driver of their mini ambulance who happened to be my grandson. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. For the member's statements, the member from Nipissing. Thank you, uh, Speaker. The City of North Bay has taken a very definitive stand on the recommendations of this government's expert panel on public health, especially as they relate to integration of 
uh, public health units and local health integration networks. A recent resolution passed by City Council notes, quote, there was a lack of consultation with northern municipalities or consideration of the diverse needs of northerners. It further notes, quote, regionalization of public health units with centralized decision-making will have significant negative consequences for local public health and municipalities. As well, it points out the current cost-shared provincial municipal funding formula of 75 and 25 percent will not support the implementation of the proposed recommendations. They've resolved that, quote, North Bay City Council does not support the recommendations of the expert panel uh, and is in agreement with the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, urging the Minister of Health not to adopt them. Speaker, health units need to integrate more with health care agencies, no question, but this is not the route to take. This is another example of this government not putting patients first, especially in northern and rural Ontario. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Member Stephen, a member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Speaker. I tend to be a very patient person, uh, but when it comes to offloading device for diabetic people with ulcer on their foot, I can't take this anymore. The, you know, Speaker, every four hours in our province, somebody has a leg or a foot amputated. That is 2,000 people every single year in Ontario has a foot amputated because of an ulcer that won't heal, yet we have a body of evidence that shows us that if we were to fund offloading devices, most of those amputations would be prevented. Most of those people would heal and be able to walk on their two legs like you and I. The Diabetes uh, Association of Canada put that body of evidence to the Minister of Health in 2015. The Minister of Health received it and said we need to do our own research, which they did through Health Quality Ontario. Health Quality Ontario handed their report to the Ministry of Health in 2016, and here we are in November 2017, and Ontario has done nothing. I can't take this anymore, Speaker. Something has to be done. I want this minister to listen to the body of evidence and do the right thing and fund offloading device like Diabetes Canada tells them to do, like Health Quality Ontario has told them to do. And if they don't do this soon, there will be hundreds of amputees on the front lawn of Queen's Park showing this government what inaction looks like. Thank you. For the members, the member from Barry. Thank you, Speaker. This April, Hospice Simcoe, in my riding of Barry, added a new staff member to their team a golden Labrador named Daisy. Oh. She is a three-year-old certified COPE trained service dog who spent the first two years of her life training for the day she would begin her career as a full-time facility dog. Nice. Daisy is the first full-time service facility dog to work at a hospice in Ontario. Service dogs can reduce anxiety, provide comfort, and are wonderful listeners. Daisy plays a special role for our youngest residents and visitors as an extraordinary companion for them, their siblings and other family members. One widow of a resident sent a letter to the hospice thanking Daisy for helping to calm her down the morning that her husband died. She wrote, Daisy came straight over to me and put her head in my lap and then lay on my feet. What a wonder, wonderful feeling of comfort she gave me. My family were all there, but that beautiful dog knew how I was feeling and ignored everyone else there. The adoption fees for Daisy were provided by the Tonglin Foundation, and her veterinary care is donated by Dr. Patricia Lecton. She spends her time with residents and their visitors, is a companion to those attending grief and support sessions, and is a valued support for the staff and the volunteers. Welcome, Daisy. Thank you. For the member, Stephen, the member from Chatham Kent. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Water Wells First is an organization of concerned rural people whose wells are being contaminated by pile driving of industrial wind turbines in North Chatham Kent. 
They've been fighting a water contamination issue for over a year. Of note, this problem did not exist before the installation of industrial wind turbines in Dover and Chatham Townships. The bedrock is made of Kettle Point black shale, known, known to contain uranium, copper, lead, and arsenic, just to name a few. Pile-driving vibrations break up this toxic shale below the groundwater and contaminates it. Area residents can't drink, bathe, or wash their clothes because of this. Local wells are being poisoned as the government continues to allow pile driving. Last count, 14 wells have been contaminated. My colleague from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex, and I have visited farms, spoken with affected residents where their water is bad, and we've seen the effects firsthand. What must be tested is the black particulates found in the water. Therefore, in accordance with the Ontario Health Prevention and Promotion Act, I'm demanding that the Ministry of Health conduct a health hazard investigation, stop the erection of turbines in North Kent Pattern Energy Project, and stop the construction of turbines in the Otter Creek area where height variances will be 200 feet higher than current turbines putting endangered species at risk. If the government continues to allow the erection of these massive turbines, then it's clear to me that they are only interested in the money generation and protecting their failed Green Energy Act. I say protect the people and future generations, protect their property, and mostly protect our pure, clean, underground source of water. Thank you, Thank you sir. Here, here. Further, members, further member statements? The member from Eglinton Lawrence. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. First of all, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, a former uh, member uh, from, I think, Downsview, right? Uh, Eduardo De Santo is here. Uh, Eduardo. Uh, these are part of a citizens group fighting uh, the uh, demolition of the heart and soul of the Italian community, the Columbus Center. Pietro Cuglieri, uh, Joseph Baglieri, Elio Costa, and Victor Francescuti, and also a renowned constitutional lawyer, Paul Cavaluzzo, was here. Uh, today they were here basically telling the Minister of Education that they don't want $32 million of taxpayers' money used by the Catholic School Board to team up with a developer to destroy the Columbus Center. That's what they said very clearly. The Catholic School Board has 16 acres to build a new Dante High School, a new Regina Monday Elementary School. Build it on those 16 acres. Don't build it by demolishing the Columbus Center and you destroy our art gallery, you destroy our library, you destroy our architecturally significant rotunda. So they're telling the Minister of Education, who I know is here listening, is that don't let the Catholic School Board demolish and destroy the heart and soul of the Italian community, the Columbus Center. Let the Catholic School Board release the documents, the secret agreement that they signed with the developers to demolish the Columbus Center. Release the documents, make them public. That's what they're saying. Thank you. Further members' statements? A member from here on Bruce. Thank you very much, Speaker. This year, I'd like to recognize a number of people from the riding of Huron Bruce for excellence in something that they absolutely love. November 3rd to 12th this year was the 95th Royal Agricultural Winter Fair. It is always an event of the year when the country comes to the city, something where those in agriculture come together and celebrate the very best of the best. Over 20,000 visitors and 6,000 animals walk through the royal doors. Cattle, sheep, goats, pigs, rabbits, and horses alike, plus crops, vegetables, food, and chefs. Many attractions of, over and above that make the Royal what it is truly known as a Royal experience. There are many strong competitors that come from the riding of Huron Bruce, and traditional names tend to be McConnell, McIntyre, Gilcrest, McPherson, and there's a common theme in amongst all those families. But I'd like to recognize the fact that we have new peoples cropping up and, and getting to the Royal and having the opportunity to stretch their legs. And some of those people are Alex and Troy Coltis and Ashley Higgins of Brussels. And, you know, I'd even like to give a shout out to the Loyal Line Limousine of Godridge, who took first place with their junior limousine. But what I find most interesting is the Royal is a celebration of agriculture and agri-food products. And this year we had chefs going from Addicton, Addictons of Exeter and Part 2 Bistro in Blythe. They did incredibly well in their respective competitions. And Cal Bell Beer uh, actually stood tall in their respective divisions as well. Thank you very much. 
just uh, thank all members for their statements. And just before I move to reports by committees, uh, this speaker has started a tradition of always introducing former members, and it was leapfrogged. So I want to introduce Ordando Sedanto from Downsview in the 30th, 31st, and 32nd Car Parliament. Thank you very much for joining us, former members. Uh, uh, I, I also would. I would also recognize. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> I would also like to recognize the member from Prince Edward Hastings on a point of order. Yeah, thank you. Point of order, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to welcome some special guests that have come all the way from uh, Napanee here this afternoon. Uh, Dave and Gwen Mills of Napanee, and I'll be introducing legislation in honor of their late son Garrett in a few moments. Thank you. Welcome. I'm glad you're with us. And therefore, it's now time for reports by committees. The uh, member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.